all the IPM stuff that I mentioned, the mattress and pillow covers. So what we do with that is that we give them to the family and then if they're not on by the second visit, you, you, we have a lot of single moms and these things are hard to get on if you've ever tried to put one on by yourself. Uh, so we do it with them. And then this last thing, it's called an encounter form. This is an assessment form that the community health worker fills out in the home and it's actually sent back to the medical provider. And not only just the primary, but if we know that there's a pulmonologist or if we know there's an allergist or it goes to all three. And then on the facts cover sheet, you actually have all the doctors listed so that they all know, oh, right. Oh, I didn't know that they're seeing so-and-so. So what does that encounter form include? Um, at the top of it, it's going to, it includes asthma symptomology. So it's basically in the last two weeks, have you had any symptoms, daytime, nighttime, rescue medication use, and uh, change in activity level? The second part of the form is coordination of care. Last ER visit, last hospitalization, last doctor visit. The third part is asthma action plan. Is there one in the house? Okay, let's take a look at it. Is it used as a teaching tool? Does it need to be updated, et cetera? You finally get into your protocols of what the community health worker follows up in the home. And then you have your problem list. And that's where you've got medication adherence, technique, roaches, mice, smoking, caregiver depression, smoke detectors, CO monitors, the kitchen sink, mold. You name it, it's in there if it's related to asthma. And so with that form, that gets faxed. And I think this has been We've, we've gotten feedback from physicians where it's helpful to get this information because they don't have someone that can actually go into the home and say, you know what, they've got this massive roach infestation. So when they know that, they can make those steps to change, you know, the medical, what, what that child is on medically if they feel fit. So we're just providing that information. FYI, they've got five cats, you know, they didn't know that, so. So what we're going to show you next is just some preliminary results, and it's based on it's based on the encounter form from baseline to final one year visit. And not all the data is in. Okay, so you already know about the ER stuff, right? That um, sixty some percent of our kids, when they enter the program, have been in the ER in the last year. And we've got some Medicaid data that we're just starting to look at at our kids. So this is self-report. And we're finding that, it's, that it is reflective. So the self-report is, there are similarities and we're, sh we're seeing that the RAD kids are actually sicker. They've had more hospitalizations, more ER visits. So what you see is that at entry of the program, you're high and then by the one year final visit, you're down to around 14%. So something very similar with hospitalizations, we're looking at percents here again, that 66% of those kids that come into the program have been, to the, been hospitalized, and at one year, we're down to about 13. And then we look at mice, and you're like, hmm, oh, that's weird. So the baseline is that 20-page assessment form where basically we're asking you, like, when was the last time you went to the ER? And, when was the last time you failed your medication? And let's look at your medication. And um, they ask about self-efficacy and quality of life and 20 pages of medical questions. But they always ask, do you have any mice? Because I've got supplies with me if you want, if you want something before I come back. Well, on the HEC, the H, it's called the um, Home Environmental Assessment, that's when that community health worker goes not only to the kitchen, the bedroom, the bathroom, the child's bedroom, did I mention that, and then the basement. And they'll do a walkthrough with the family to help. It's an educational process. And this is where that relationship really is important. Because th when we started training the community health workers, they got to do this in my house. And I had cleaned for like two weeks. And I had like, like put all my like food in like glass jars. And it was done pretty good, except for the basement. And uh, I remember when they were marking the basement, and they were like severe dust. And I was just like. This is like uncomfortable. I don't. <laughs> so they they've somehow been able to do this and get back in the home, which is nice. And you say so you see this severe mice mouse problem drop. Same with the roaches, it gets better. 
uh, they really love the gel and the baits. It's just so easy. So that, you know, it's, it's almost like a passive thing that um, the families don't have to do that much. You know, it's just a little bloop, bloop. And the same with smoking. Now the smoking I'm wondering about, and um, we don't measure cotinine levels. And the reason I wonder is because probably by the, like the third or the fourth visit, they're like, are you smoking? How are you doing with your smoking? I don't smoke in the house anymore. You don't? So I don't know. I'm, I'm curious um, what this will show um, later on. But our, what we consider success in smoking is that you move it outside. And so this is the severe rating here, so where they're smoking in the home with the child present. So if they really aren't doing this, I think it's great. We really haven't seen much change in pets. It's um, very little. Med adherence, it's gotten better. Um, at each visit, they actually pull the meds and they, they look at them, they count them, they look at when it was last filled. So um, we have a, a pretty good sense of where that is. Med technique, it seems like when you first get in the house, there's just like, they're all over the map and they're missing, you know, step two through four and they pick up step five and they're just, it's just exactly what you saw Karen Malamute do this morning. You know, you see all kinds of things. And it's like that reinforcement. And, and I know that they, a lot of the times these kids, because we get them from the Breathmobile, which is an asthma specialty clinic. Um, we get them from you know, medical providers where I have a pretty good feeling that they've gotten some education. But it just, we need reinforcement, right? You get some, so much bombarded um, when you are initially in the doctor's office. So being in the home and actually doing that education is helpful. Days with symptoms. Oops, nights, well, nights with symptoms is the same thing. You're seeing a big difference. I think this is a combination of um, reduction of asthma triggers in the home. So you've got your vacuum cleaner, you've got your green cleaning supplies, you've got your mattress cover on, and you're washing your sheets every two weeks or once a week if necessary if you don't see an improvement. And that's it. I mean, I feel like engaging families in the, in the home environment makes a difference. Um, I think having comfortable community health workers in the field, they need a lot, they need oversight. I'm a nurse, the program manager is also a nurse, so every like encounter form that goes through, goes through a nurse. They, they you know, we go on visits together, there's a lot of training that's involved. But um, I feel like they really enjoy their work. And that partnering with the medical community is essential. Um, I feel like, and I haven't been able to tease out the data yet, that the families that are tied in closely with a medical home seem to do the best, and that's because when they go to the doctor, they reinforce about what we're doing in the home, and it's like closing that loop. So it's been nice to see. And that's it. Hey, just a, a quick question, um, and it's incredibly um, comprehensive and very admirable work, but incredibly labor-intensive, and. Um, it sounds as if your, your funding for this is principally under a, a demonstration and implementation grant. And, and I've got to ask you sort of the elephant in the room question, which is uh, what happens next? And are there elements of this that are perhaps most valuable, uh, lessons uh, that have been most poignantly learned that can be taken uh, to somebody, whether it's uh, your Medicaid uh, managed care organizations or, or the Department of Health or somebody for continued funding? So what we did was that um, we also have uh, standard like DHMH funding for our home visiting program. It's a lot smaller, but it's a three home visiting model. But what we did was that we adapted the forms from Seattle. We use the exact same encounter form. Community health workers are trained the same way to be able to do it. In the, in the um, we call it CAP, is the community asthma program, the three visiting model. That one, we don't have the money to give a vacuum cleaner. But where, we, where we've put our money is in IPM, so your pest management, and in your green cleaning. That's where we put our money. Yeah. It's tough. We're applying for competitive grants. Yeah, to keep going. So 
for uh, if, if everybody's still awake after those excellent uh, presentations, um, not to be outdone by my colleagues, um, what do you call a very large ant? A giant. That's, that, was, that was courtesy of my son. And of course, uh, what did the corn say to his dad? Hi, popcorn. So it, this, is, this is actually uh, a quite a nice uh, uh, transition because we've heard about the public health angle of uh, dealing with the challenges of and the burden of asthma. We heard about the environmental and the community initiatives. What I'm hoping to uh, speak of a little bit is what the healthcare providers in the acute care setting, the emergency department uh, in, in my particular situation, but also the inpatient setting and hopefully also the uh, other primary care providers can do uh, once a child or an adult for that matter presents with acute symptoms and how what we like to call a comprehensive approach to asthma can be accomplished. So uh, you'll see my contact information there and uh, so, oops. All right. Space bar. Okay, space bar. Very good. So, so I, I won't dwell on the statistics because that was uh, emphasized quite a bit. Uh, what I'd like to spend the next uh, 60, the last 60 minutes of the uh, presentation today on is, uh, you know, uh, how the emergency department or the acute care setting can uh, emphasize or can can uh, improve asthma care. So it was uh, the disparity in asthma care was highlighted by our colleagues before, but I think this is another striking uh, example. If you look at the prevalence of asthma in the various ethnic populations, you can see the Hispanic, non-Hispanic, Caucasian, and the African American. American population, that the prevalence, though slightly higher in the African Americans, is not as strikingly higher. You can see that the emergency department visits, the, the angle that I see, is significantly higher, especially when we're uh, dealing with a population in inner cities such as we are. And then when you talk about mortality associated with asthma, you can see that this is what disproportionality looks like. It's not just a matter of prevalence, but it's the morbidity and the mortality associated with asthma that is quite striking. So at the University of Maryland Hospital for Children, or as it's now called, University of Maryland Children's Hospital, and I have to still get, get used to that, um, our cross-section of families is as it's listed here. 87% of our uh, children are Medica have uh, Medicaid as their insurance, and a uh, very smaller, much, much smaller percentage have uh, private insurance. Um, you can see that though we think of asthma as, a, of course, a disease of various age groups, it is quite striking uh, that the younger age groups are so uh, heavily uh, affected. And the, the striking part is that, as you can see, the under three-year population is what we rarely call asthma. You know, we, we dance around the topic, we call it RAD or we call it wheezing, or we call it weaseling, or we can call it all kinds of things, but we rarely label it as it should be, and that is, of course, to the detriment of controller therapies or education or all the other things that can be done. So we purposefully highlight the fact that there are many, many young children who really do have asthma, and that helps us uh, better recognize and hopefully approach the, the problem. Um, you can see the male-female uh, 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 breakdown here, and then lastly, you can see, oops, uh, boy, and I'm not going to dare to go back, but you can see on the side, though the majority of uh, our patients in this one year period had only one emergency department visit, you can see that almost a quarter in just our emergency department, and we realize that Baltimore has a high density of hospitals, so just because they didn't come to our emergency department didn't mean that they didn't present to another. But of just about a quarter of the patients had more than one emergency department, our emergency department visit, and a significant number actually had uh, more than three in that one year period. So um, that's where our population lies, the non-Hispanic African American population with a high burden of emergency department and inpatient visits, and that is why we took an interest in um, uh, dealing with the uh, asthma problem from the ER setting. 